I worked for a very successful agent. I learned what they do day in, day out, hour after hour in listing presentations, in appraisals, in negotiations, in difficult situations. And I just got to learn by osmosis. You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers, and leaders. With thanks to our partner Connect Now, Elevate brings you the best tools, thinking, and strategies to elevate your results. To get access to all of Elite Agent's premium resources, including a detailed episode guide for this podcast, visit joineliteagent.com. And for more information about how Connect Now can make moving easier on your clients, visit connectnow.com.au. Welcome to another episode of the Elevate podcast, where we delve into some of the most interesting minds in business and in real estate for the very best tips and strategies for you to implement to elevate your business. I'm Elevate podcast producer Cass Charlesworth, and I'll be hosting today's show. My guest today is Urban X co-founder and CEO Dan Argent. With two decades of experience in the industry, Dan has gone from rookie to high-performing agent to starting his own business and beyond. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks so much. Great to be here. It's great to have you here today because we're going to do a little bit of an exercise where you're going to mentor me through a career. We're going to phrase it like this. I've come to you, Dan. I've had enough of journalism and deadlines. I think I'd make a great real estate agent. I quite like people. I have a passion for property. Could you walk me through my career and mentor me up through the stages along the way? Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you just want to go through the whole uh, journey or just start at the beginning? Let's start at the beginning. Actually, let's start with your beginning because I understand that you didn't necessarily start out in real estate. You're actually studying law. Is that correct? Yeah, well, there's two parts to that. And and um, and the second part will answer the question about, uh, you know, if you are uh, keen to get out of journalism and get into real estate, which I'd highly recommend too, by the way, because uh, real estate is one of the best careers in the world. Um, I, I was, I, I, I uh, you know, thought law would be the right thing to do in school. Um, you know, it's one of those careers that people aspire to, I suppose, law, medicine, you know, engineering, various things. Uh, I would love by the end of my career in this industry, if people aspire to get into real estate, it's actually an incredible career. I uh, don't think enough young people, uh, you know, dream of, of a uh, career in this industry, but hopefully one day they do. Um, and so I started out in law and, uh, and I had an office job during that time and I hated being stuck within four walls. I, in fact, I, I was on the top floor of this building with these beautiful views over a park and, um, and I was stuck inside and all these people were outside and all I wanted to, to do was be outside. And that made me realize then and there, I do not want a job that's stuck inside an office. I want to be out and about. Um, and so, you know, law is very much in the office and, uh, and I decided that wasn't for me. And so I decided to, to get into real estate. Getting into real estate, which is really the answer uh, sort of to your other question there, and what I did and what I recommend, and I have people contact me every week asking that question, you know, thinking about getting into real estate, what should I do? Um, what I did was I went and uh, approached someone who owned an agency and asked if I could, you know, join them and become an agent. And I thought I'd just go straight in, you know, I can talk to people, this will be easy. Uh, and they said, uh, no, 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 what you need to do is work for one of our agents for a year and learn the ropes. And I just thought that was the biggest kick in the teeth. I thought, no, I'm, I'm better than that. I can, but, but actually it was the greatest thing I ever did at the start of my career because it's like an apprenticeship. And I worked for a very successful agent. I learned what they do day in, day out, hour after hour, in listing presentations, in appraisals, in negotiations, in difficult situations. And I just got to learn by osmosis. And when I got the opportunity to go in, into my first ever listing appointment, like the words just came out of my mouth and I didn't even really know where they were coming from, but I'd just been absorbing that over that 12 month period. And, and I got the listing and I sold it. So, you know, I obviously must have learned something, but but that's what I would say as well to anyone thinking about starting a career in real estate is do a cadetship, do an apprenticeship, work for an agent, learn the ropes, whether it's a year or two years, and then take that and, and go on and you'll build a much more successful uh, career in my opinion. That's great advice. But what are some of the challenges in that first year that I might be encountering um, as, a, as a rookie and working with another agent? 
income primarily, uh, you know, it, it, it was, I was, I was losing $50 a week in that job and I did not have a lot of expenses, right? Like I, you know, rented a room off a mate. Uh, I, you know, had a $6,000 Honda Civic, <laughs> you know, I mean, I did not have some glamorous lifestyle and I was still losing $50 a week. Um, but I just, sort of looked at it as an investment and, and and even now you know a lot of agents that i know don't pay associates a lot but you know there's a value uh equation here right if you're an associate and you're learning well you're actually doing like a paid apprenticeship yes you're doing a lot of work for the agent and yes over sort of that you know period of time whether it's a year or six months or two years um, you'll probably start to give more and more value at the beginning you're not really giving a lot of value at all you're just taking value, which is knowledge from the agent. So, so I would definitely say income is, is a real challenge. And I feel for, um, I mean, I was, I feel lucky that I got into real estate when I was 20, but I feel for people that are very talented and might be, you know, double that, say 40, just as a random number that have already built a career in something else and are already earning good money, but not great money or they're not that happy in what they do and would like to change into real estate. And I've met many of them, uh, but they just can't afford to, to go backwards and, uh, and therefore just, you know, sort of don't bother. I, I really feel for, for those people. So income would be number one. And then probably two, just the kind of work, to be honest, you might come from being, you know, pretty good at something else like journalism. And then you sort of go to doing cold calling and, and door knocking and letterbox dropping and, and opening doors and some very basic, you know, work um, to, to learn the ropes. And there can be some fear around that cold calling and open, knocking on doors. So what would your advice be to people who are sort of bracing to, to do that? Well, feel the fear and do it anyway. Uh, I mean, you know, that is the number one uh, deciding factor, in my opinion, uh, between agents that make it and agents that don't. Uh, agents that are scared of talking to people shouldn't be in real estate. You mentioned uh, at the very beginning that you've got a passion for property. Uh, but I couldn't care less, to be honest, uh, about property, uh, you know, in, in, in relation to it being the most important aspect. It's not like unimportant. You need to have some interest in property, but it's actually all about people that's that's all this is you are dealing with buyers on their journey and you are dealing with sellers on their journey and it doesn't really matter that it's a property because it's the journey that you're actually assisting people with so if you're scared of talking to people but you love property be an architect if or an interior designer or a stylist right if that's your, if that's your passion but people has to be your passion in this game and and so you know, going and speaking to people. Yeah. Okay. It might be cold, but you know, you've got to start the relationship somehow, right? It's kind of like starting relationships, you know, like you're never going to meet a boy or a girl and have start a relationship if you don't like talking to new people, right? Like you've got to. So, you know, that is what it is. You are starting relationships just with a lot of people and, uh, and then sort of nurturing those over a period of time to put yourself in a position where you might be able to get their business when they're ready to, to do that, which on average is about every 10 years. Um, but you know, you need to get comfortable with, with speaking to people and, and cold calling. Excellent. Okay. I can do that. I can cold call and I'm comfortable speaking to people. So I'm now a year into my real estate career or so, and I'm going it alone. So I'm stepping out from that associate position and I'm going into sales by myself. What are the big challenges and hurdles and things that I need to be aware of at this point? So number one is that you need to define a niche, okay? Uh, agents that are too general and don't specialize in anything just get lost in the sea of sameness, right? So uh, carving out a niche. Now that niche might be an area. Um, I know you're in the Noosa region. So you might say, well, I'm going to focus on Noosa or I'm going to focus on Melbourne CBD or I'm going to focus on the Gold Coast, whatever area it is. And then you might define it a little bit further, like um, say we run with Noosa, for example, I might want to specialize in Hastings Street Apartments. I might want to specialize in waterfront properties. I might want to specialize in 
uh, townhouses. I mean, what, whatever that is. So, so the number one thing I would say is carve out a niche that you become a specialist in. That's going to give you the ability to stand out and also offer really pointed advice to people with those kinds of properties. Number two is that you've got to build a database. And this is really what cold calling and door knocking is all about. You're actually just trying to meet every single person in your niche that you've identified and then get their details into a database. Um, and then the third thing that I would note is put yourself out there. You've, you've identified a niche, you've started to build a database, you've got to stand out, right? There are a lot of agents. This is a very competitive industry. And so you've got to start to put yourself out there. And I would just say, invest in marketing, invest in marketing yourself, uh, do quarterly reports, do email newsletters, do social media, do local events, uh, do anything that you can do to, to stand out from the crowd. And what sort of messages should I be putting out there on my social media and, and in my reports? What should I be telling people? Another great question. I think you'll be great at real estate, by the way. So we should chat uh, off air after this. Uh, so two things. Uh, number one, once you've identified your own niche, it's really important to start to identify your USP. So your unique, and the key word there is unique selling proposition. Now, unique means that it's unique to you not anyone else in your market or in your niche, right? So a lot of times people say, well, I'm a great negotiator. Sure, but everyone's going to say that. Well, I work six days a week. Sure, but everyone says that. Well, I you know, have 10 years experience. Yes, but everyone says they've got 10 years experience. So, so these aren't things that are unique. These things need to be unique to you. So I would create messaging. So the two types of messaging I would create would be number one, what are your unique selling points? And how do you start to... Um, you know, put those out. Um, I'll just give you really like one super quick example on that. When I started uh, my career, I needed to find ways to stand out. I worked in an area uh, called Paddington in Brisbane, which is a highly competitive area. Uh, most areas are competitive, but you know, this was a you know, blue chip suburb within Brisbane, highly competitive. And I was up against some very entrenched uh, agents. Now I'm 2021 20, at this point, and these people have been around for a long time, super entrenched. How am I going to stand out? And I realized that no one did opens on Sundays. So I thought, well, I'm happy to do opens on Saturdays and Sundays. I'll just work seven days a week. That was one of my unique selling points. And I just talked about that so often. You know, how I spoke about that was that buyers work probably five days a week. The only time they have to look at properties is on the weekend. Why would you only open your property for half of that time? And all opens are between 10 and two on a Saturday. So they're trying to juggle fitting in all these uh, open homes between a very small uh, time window. If we open your property on Sunday as well, A, it doubles your exposure and B, you sort of, now your property will stand out from the crowd. I beat so many uh, high profile agents at the start of my career on that one strategy alone. I then started to get results where buyers had come to my opens on Saturday and then come back on the Sunday and, and, and buy them. And that's really sort of one of the key platforms that I built my career on. So that's just an example of a USP. No one else did Sundays, by the way. That's why I was unique. Um, the second messaging is you've got to add value to your audience. It is good to talk about your USP. Absolutely. But always don't forget with them what's in it for me no one cared that i work sundays unless there was something in it for them no one cares that you are the number one agent in that market unless there's something in it for them no one cares that you just sold a property in their street unless there's something in it for them so always come back to with them and unless your messaging has speaks to with them what's in it for them you're just wasting your time because no one cares about grandstanding and, and, and that sort of language. So always, always, always add value. And by the way, I just add that point to cold calling and door knocking and any of those kinds of things. I've never really viewed it as cold calling or, or, or whatnot because I'm always adding value. So if I call you and I've never spoken to you, yes, by definition, it might be cold, but I'm calling you for a very specific reason and I'm calling you with a key piece of information or data that hopefully you don't already know. And therefore, you leave that call more educated than before, in which case that's great. I've just had this transfer of value and I've left you smarter or better informed than before you answered the phone. Absolutely. And I've had those cold calls from agents where they, they give you value. They tell you what's going on in the market or what the property next door sold for. And that is a very valuable conversation. I want to know that. I'm happy to hear from an agent who's telling me that I might be able to sell my property soon. You know, that's great. 
Um, so now I, I'm out on my own. I'm doing okay and I'm really busy. I can't keep up with everything that's going on. So when should I bring on a team and who should, who should I have around me? Where should I start? Everyone in real estate is looking for the secret recipe to, to grow. What's the, what's the secret sauce? And I'm going to touch on what I think are the two. Um, I'll talk to the first one because it's the question that you've just asked. Team, you cannot, no business is ever going to outgrow you, right? So you, you will always be the limiting factor. You will always be the tightest point in the funnel. Um, you'll always be the red line in your own business. So the business is never going to outgrow you. And the only way to achieve growth at a certain point in time is to build a team. Now, um, when should you do it? Look, that really varies for everyone. But as soon as you're established, if you're serious about this industry and building a career, I'd be building a team. Because if you don't build, if you don't have an associate as an agent, you are an overpaid associate, right? If you are attending things that you don't need to, like as in must, then you really you're overpaid for doing those jobs. Now, I would say, you know, any agent attending photo shoots is a waste of time. Attending building and pest inspections is a waste of time. Attending valuations, um, meeting the buyers so they can measure the fridge space, uh, you know, doing pre-settlement inspections. Um, if you list a property and it needs painting and the deck needs oiling and needs an exterior wash and you're organizing quotes, you're wasting your time. These are all of the things that don't need to be done. They do need to be done, but they don't need to be done by you. And, and an agent's time is best spent going back to what we spoke about before, which is advertising themselves and building a database and nurturing that database. And the more time they spend doing that, the bigger and better business that they're going to build. And so and so like a car, uh, like, a, like a manual car, I'm, a, I'm not sure how many listeners remember manual cars and changing gears, but like if you just take off in first gear and you never change gears, your speed will get capped at a certain point and your you know, taco will be redlining and the engine will be screaming. And the, and, and the equivalent to that in real estate is that you're, you're burning out, your GCI is remaining the same every year. Um, and you just can't fit in any more appointments. You know, you've probably gone past the point there where you should have hired someone. But if you are at that point, go and hire someone now. And if you are before that point, great, uh, hire someone now. And then that way you'll, you'll never reach that point. And that formula, by the way, just continues because when you and your associate are starting to approach red line, you bring on someone else. And then when that team's starting to approach red line, you bring on someone else. And that's how you can continue to scale a real estate business as an agent. How do I get over the fear of being able to afford an associate? So now I'm not carrying just me, I'm carrying another associate as well and I'm responsible for them. So how do I get over that fear? There's two things uh, there. A great shift for agents to make is that they are actually operating a business, right? Whether that's a business within a business or whether that is a standalone business, you are still running a business. And so I would not view it as spending. I would view it as investing. Like I'm investing in this associate uh, to, to, to actually to do two things. Number one, to free up my time to do more high value tasks. Uh, but number two, you should always um, have a mind on ROI, return on investment. If I'm paying an associate now, for ease of math, let's just say 50 grand a year, probably be more, but maybe the base would be 50 plus bonuses. But for ease of math, we're just going to say 50. Um, I would want a return on investment, maybe four to one. So I want that person returning me 200 grand a year. Now, how are they going to do that? Well, I'm going to divide my average commission uh, by that. So let's just say my average commission is you know, 20 grand, that's 10 listings. So then now that associate needs to bring me in 10 listings across one year to return me 200 grand and I've paid them 50. Now I've got a four on one re, uh, return on investment. That's one in uh, one a month uh, accounting for two months holiday a year, nothing sort of too extraordinary, right? Great, but nothing too extraordinary. And if you give that associate the tools and the uh, guidance and the training and the KPIs, KPIs is critical on that, by the way, um, they should easily be able to, to do that. Certainly the right person would be able to do that. 
they've uh, really uh, you know, given you a great ROI on your investment. And number two, you've taught them how to generate listings. And that is the number one thing that every agent needs to be successful. After a year or sort of two years or whatever time frame you and that person agree on and when they're ready, um, they now have the tools to go out and generate listings for themselves because they've been doing it for you. So it's actually a, a, a great win-win. So that's the first thing that I would say is um, it, treat it like a business, return on investment. It's an investment, not a, um, an expense. And two, um, you're already spending the money anyway, because if you're not paying uh, an associate, you are an overpaid associate. Um, and, 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 and if you want to sort of talk about that for a second, you could just divide um, how much you're earning. Uh, and you know that might be um, $500,000 a year GCI, just to pick a, a random number. Um, and so let's say you're working you know, 50 hours a week times 48 weeks a year, divide 48 by 50, we'll give you how many hours a, a year you're working and then uh, divide 500,000 by that number. And now you've actually got your hourly rate. If your hourly rate is you know $300 an hour or $500 an hour or $1,000 an hour, um, every hour you spend not doing something of that value that you could pay someone else $30 an hour to do, you're actually just you know devaluing yourself. Excellent. Okay. That's good business advice. All right. So now at this point, me and my, my team and I, we're going quite well, but I, I really need to kick it up a gear. I want to be a top performer. I want to be one of these agents that receives an area, best of the best. What do I need to do now? Time is your friend. Yeah. So there's no shortcut to success. You look at um, nearly all of the highest performers and they have remained consistent in an area or a niche uh, over a long period of time and they have built up that trust in an area. And so that's, that's really, really important. Um, so, so, so number one time is your friend. Uh, obviously we've spoken about team because that's important. It's never going to outgrow you. And the third thing I would just say is that marketing is the one thing I wish I understood better uh, at the start of my career. And so for anyone listening to this, uh, you know, whether they're at the start or whether they're sort of 10 years in um, or, 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 you know, longer, marketing is absolutely critical. We are in an industry. And if you are the only agent in your market, you are very, very lucky. It's probably highly unlikely. I know your market well at Noosa and there are a lot of agents and that is the same in every market that I'm aware of in Australia. And therefore, you've got to stand out. There is an amazing book. I'm going to give it a plug uh, called Purple Cow by Seth Godin. I'm sure everyone has heard of Seth Godin, the king of marketing. Um, sort of his cornerstone book is called Purple Cow. And the gist of that book is this. If you are you know, with your partner and you're sort of off for the weekend and you're driving out to the country and you, you, know, you leave the city and, and you start to see some cows and you're like, oh, look, honey, some cows. And you know, that's quite exciting. But after you've driven past you know, acres and acres and paddocks and paddocks of cows, you sort of really don't care about the cows anymore. But if you were to then come across a purple cow standing in a paddock like you'd be pulling over, you'd be, you know, getting a selfie and, and putting it on Instagram. It'd go viral. The news would be there. Everyone would be talking about this purple cow. That is the gist of the book, right? There are lots of, um, you know, brown cows, you know, um, which is um, what uh, Seth's talking about in, in any industry, whether it's real estate or lawyers or accountants or, you know, air conditioning company, doesn't matter. Right. So, um, and so there's a lot, and then you want to be the purple cow. You want to be the one that stands out. And, and, and there's a number of different ways to do that. And I don't want to sort of take away all the points in the book. I would uh, suggest to all of your listeners to go and um, buy that book and read it straight away. Best uh, book I've ever read uh, from a marketing perspective. But you've got to stand out and you've got to market yourself. And, uh, and, and, and that would be the, the next stage of growth for, for that team that you, you mentioned. You mentioned before as well, uh, time is my friend, but there's a lot of distractions in real estate. How do I avoid distractions and compound on the results that I'm, I've already achieved each year? There's a really great exercise that you can do around that. And, um, you know, we're at the beginning, you know, relatively uh, of, of a new year. You could go back over your last 12 months and look at all of your listings. Just get a list of all of your listings and write down next to every single one of those listings where it came from. And I mean, like to the very first 
point of where it came from. Where did you meet that person? Did you meet them at an open home? Did you cold call them? Are they our past client? Just have a look, right? Write down and then do a bit of a tally on the side. You might find that, you know, depending on at what stage you're at in your career, um, 70% were from past clients. Uh, 10% were from buyers that you met at opens, 10% were from um, neighbors around other properties. I mean, you know, you create your own ratio, right? That's going to give you where you need to invest your time. If 70% of your listings are coming from past clients, invest 70% of your time into your past clients, you know, be on the phone to them, assist them with their renovation plans, um, you know, go and see them on their one year anniversary and drop off an updated valuation, um, like a detailed updated valuation for them. You know, um, but, but, but if 70% of your business has come from door knocking, then spend 70% of your time doing that. So that's the first thing I would say, get really clear on what's working. Because if you were to spend 70% of your time on door knocking, but only 10% of your business was coming from door knocking, then you're really wasting your time, you know, doing that, right? So, so find out where your business is coming from and really leverage that. And two, time blocking is super important. So I always have committed to do two hours a day of telephone um, calls, right? So whether I do that from nine till 11 or from four till six, that's a time block. It doesn't get canceled out of my diary. It can get moved in my diary, but it can't get deleted out of my diary. So if I book it in from nine till 11, and then you say, Dan, I'd love to do a, a podcast. Um, can we do that in the morning? Um, you know, I might just um, swipe that down in my calendar, but I'll still make sure I'm doing, I'm doing um, those, those calls every day. So, you know, just create, find out what works, put it in your diary, make those the big blocks that you fit everything else around. And if you've ever got to move them and, you know, we are in an industry that's sort of pretty liquid, move them, don't cancel them. Excellent. Okay. So I'm time blocking and I'm doing all the right things and I'm built on my results. And now I'm sitting here at an agency where I've, I've loved being for a while, except I feel there's more to me. I'm quite ambitious. I've always wanted to have my own business. How do I know I'm the right person and when is the right time? It's a really great question. And I think a lot of not just agents, but um, any professional service uh, can feel this way. You might be uh, a real estate agent, you might be an insurance broker or a, uh, a finance broker, you might be um, an air conditioner guy, you know, my, my goddaughter is, is dating an electrician and he's just doing his apprenticeship and he's keen to start his own business, you know, once he's got the experience. So, you know, I think when you're in a professional services industry, which real estate is obviously um, one of, uh, you know, it's natural for people to, once they're established, uh, want to go out on their own. And I would, and I've been in this industry for 17 years, nearly every agent I've ever met or spoken to at some point wants to go out on their own. Um, and there's generally only one thing that holds them back from that, which we might get to. But I think in terms of when is the right time, what I would say is as soon as you're established, um, I made two mistakes early on in my career. Uh, number one, I didn't understand marketing. I certainly understood how to market properties. I just didn't apply it enough to myself. Um, so marketing and standing out, we've already touched on that. Um, but number two is uh, get out on your own as soon as you're established. I think I waited too long. It took me seven years. Um, and I only ever worked for one agency for that entire period of time. Uh, and it was a great agency and I learned a lot and I owe them um, so much. Uh, but I was there for seven years and I was probably spinning my wheels for the last three wanting to go out on my own, but just didn't. And when I obviously say go out on my own, I mean in my own business with my own brand uh, rather than you know out as an independent agent. Um, and so my answer to your question is as soon as you're established, uh, going out on your own is the best accelerator you can possibly do for your career because you can continue to build your team, um, but you now have the ability. And this is what I realized when I went on my, uh, out on my own when you have your own business, you get to create your own brand. When you have your own brand, you can market yourself. When you can market yourself, you can stand out from the crowd. And if standing out from the crowd is critical, and according to Seth Godin, world-renowned marketing expert, it is, then having your own brand is the way to do that. What Do I need to be at a specific GCI? Do I need to have a certain amount of years under my belt before I should be considering it? 
Look, you know, there's no hard and fast rule around that. Um, I worked for the agency that I worked for for seven years. I think for the last three years, I, I I knew I was ready. I was just held back by fear. I didn't know, you know, if I was still going to be as successful if I left. Um, and so, you know, that was sort of four years in, you know, is that the number? It doesn't have to be, you know, for some people, it, it can be less for some people, it's much more, but you certainly want to know what you're doing, right? Um, you, you are going out on your own. You want to know what you're doing. You probably know what you're doing before four years, but let's just, you know, use that as a, as a, as a a bit of a guide uh, and then in terms of fees well you know fees is very dependent on the area that you work in i mean you might be very good and and very experienced and don't work in a high uh, dollar value area and therefore um you know the gci levels aren't as high as they might be in a blue chip inner city area but you know as a bit of a yardstick i've seen about two hundred and fifty thousand a year as a level that I certainly guide people on, you know, I think up to a quarter of a million a year in GCI, um, probably being, um, you know, uh, in an agency sort of environment uh, is is better for you. Um, but from that point on, um, I would view you as being established enough. And again, that is just a yardstick because it would depend on the market, but you know, that might only be two sales a year in some markets, um, but I, I'd see you as being established enough. And also, the biggest thing I see is where the value equation changes, right? So, you know, let's just say you're on 50-50. Now, most agents I speak to are on somewhere between 45 and, and 55, 45 and 60, right? 50 is really an industry average. There will be people listening to this that are on more than that. Great. But um, as an industry average 50-50 split is pretty normal. So up to 250, you know, you're keeping about 125, the agency's getting 125 a year. Are they worth 125 a year? You'd have to answer that for yourself. And if you're an agency owner, you would want to be thinking about the value that you're providing your clients, which are the agents, uh, to ensure that you are giving them that much value. Uh, otherwise, I think people will vote with their feet and we are already seeing that. What about the fear factor, Dan, which you mentioned was something that probably held you back from going into business um, earlier. Um, I'm, I'm quite nervous about this prospect of going out on my own. What, you know, how do I address that? What do I need to do? Fear is the number one inhibitor to growth. Number one, right? Now, it might stop you from getting into real estate, you know, because it might be a pay cut. You know, you know we spoke about that at the beginning. It might stop you from hiring a PA. It might stop you from investing in marketing. Uh, it might stop you from going out on your own. These are all things that are the keys to growth that fear can stop you from doing, right? So understand that fear is the number one inhibitor to growth. And fear is an emotion like any other emotion. Now, that might be um, happiness, that might be sadness, that might be excitement. You know, they are all emotions, just because something is scary doesn't mean that it needs to stop you from doing something. You can acknowledge, you can be self-aware enough to acknowledge that this is scary, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm making a logical decision as to why this is better. Um, I'm really excited to be talking about fear because it is the you know number one inhibitor to growth, like I said. Uh, I suggest a couple of things in terms of agents going out on their own. The first thing that I would say is revert back to that list that I suggested that you do uh, earlier where you write down all of your listings from the last 12 months next to each of those, write down where they came from. Most agents that I speak to, 90% plus of their listings are coming directly off their own work that could either be off um, their past clients and referrals. It could be from buyers that they meet at open homes. It could be from doing just listeds and just solds around every listing. Uh, it could be from networking events that they attend, but essentially wherever they were, that business would continue to come to them because it's them doing that work anyway. Right now, if you said to me, oh, no, 90% of my listings are just walk-ins into the office. And if I wasn't sitting there on roster, I wouldn't get them. Well, you should not be going out on your own. Right. But if 80 to 90% plus are coming directly to you or are off the back of your work, then you are ready and nothing's going to change. And so I would just say, feel the fear and do it anyway. I felt that same fear. I feel so much empathy for every agent that I speak to that wants to go out on their own, but is scared of doing so because I remember that. 
but that exercise I, I just explained is exactly what I did. And that list was like 80 to 90% plus off the back of my own work. And I just thought to myself, even if 20 or 30% of those people, bearing in mind, I don't ever worked for one business for um, seven years from the age of 20 to 27, right? So I was a kid, knew nothing and was very scared that my success was because of the agency that I worked at. But I thought even if I lose 20 or 30%, I'm giving away 40% anyway. So even if I lost 40% net, I would actually still be in the same financial position at the end of the year. And at least even if I do lose 40%, I now have the ability to market myself. Every listing that goes online is going to have my brand in the banner. Every signboard is going to have my brand. Every brochure is going to have my brand. Every DL is going to have my brand. Every ad on social media is going to have my brand. And if I listen to these world marketing experts that speak about the power of branding, then people will start to notice that brand and I will start to stand out. And that is actually exactly what happened. Now, there's a number of different models available. So how do I know which model is right for me? Because it's horses for courses, you know? Well, I think that's just down to the individual, to be, to be honest. You know, there are some really great initiatives. You know, there are some great groups, uh, franchise groups, uh, even um, large agencies that really do suit some people better. You know, I, I, will, I will admit that first up. Um, there are a number of um, groups and organizations like my own that are helping agents to go out on their own and have their own business, um, but without taking on all of the back-end tasks. That actually is another thing thing that can hold agents back is having to take on board all of those tasks. We, we talked about having a, an associate before to do the, the, you know, important, but not necessarily critical that you do them tasks. Well, when you go out on your own, um, there's a whole heap more like trust accounting, reconciliation, invoicing, um, ordering signboards, ordering brochures, uh, you know, preparing contracts, uh, you know, administering listings. I mean, there's so many tasks, you know, doing payroll. I mean, there's just so many tasks that certainly I wasn't aware of or ready for. And I will admit that over the seven years I ran my own agency, I burnt out and I paid a huge personal price for being an agent, writing over a million a year and running my own business, uh, which is what led me to, to realize there had to be a better way. And it was no wonder that I burnt out. And, uh, and that's really what led to the creation of Urban X for us uh, was to offer agents the best of both worlds, to be able to list and sell and have their own business and their own brand and to be in complete control, work whenever they want, wherever they want, keep more of their commission, et cetera. Uh, but outsource every single back-end task from admin to contracts to accounts, payroll, trust, uh, marketing, social media. What I would say, it's actually to answer your question, is identify the why behind every business that you're looking at. What is their why? What is their USP, by the way? What, is, what makes them unique? And what's their niche? You know, all, come back to all of the things we talked about at the beginning, you know, the platform you're looking at or the group or the agency, what's their niche? Does that identify with yours? At UrbanX, we're a hyper growth platform and we also work with high performers. We actually don't work with agents that write below 250 a year because we don't feel that that's in their best interest. And we also see the strongest growth above that. You know, we see 38% average growth in the first year, 106% average growth in the second year and beyond with the work that we do with agents. That's our niche. Um, our unique selling point is that we come from the high performance world. We work with more agents. I'll give you a quick fact. We work with more agents that write over 2 million a year than we do with agents that over 1 million a year. Saying that we still work with a lot of agents, you know, all the way through from half a million a year to one plus, to, but we work with more agents writing over two. Why? Because everything is designed for that. So if you join us and you're writing 600,000 a year, great. How do we get you to 2 million plus a year really quickly? And our why is exactly what I explained before. But you should find that out with any business that you're, you're talking to, agency, platform, whatever it might be. And just see if, I'd, if, it, um, you know, if you identify with that. And if you do, great. That's probably the right decision for you. You mentioned something earlier, you talked about burnout. And of course, many agents experience that. It's a very high pressure industry. Um, how Do you yeah. have any tips for avoiding it? 
you know, burnout is, is so real and you think it's just one of those airy fairy things until you experience it. But, you know, burnout is you just, all of your energy is gone. And, and I saw this saying that if we recharged ourselves as often as we recharge our phones, imagine how good we'd feel, right? I mean, every night you get home, you put your phone on charge. You know, if you're busy, you might have it on charge all day as well because, uh, you know, the battery's going flat. Um, how often do we put ourselves on charge? I attended um, the ARIC conference a number of years ago and um, was listening to James Tostevin, who, you know, many of your listeners would know, um, you know, certainly was one of, you know, if not the best agent in Australia and still is. But at the time, what really interested me was that he was only working about 40 weeks a year. And I just couldn't believe that. I was, you know, to be writing the numbers he was writing, and this was sort of, you know, five years ago or maybe more, and he was earning, I think, around 7 million a year uh, from memory. And I just thought, you know, how do you only work 40 weeks a year? I'm basically working 53 weeks a year. I somehow found an extra week, right? But, um, you know, he was big on, on, on taking regular breaks and, and that was basically the school holidays. Take two weeks off for all the school holidays and then take a larger break at the end of the year. And that way you're always feeling fresh. Now, I never uh, got to that point, but what I did start to realize was that if I work in short sprints of approximately 11 weeks each, 11 to 12 weeks each, and take off one week in between. So I'd basically start the year, go very hard from mid-January through till Easter, then take a week off, then go hard until the uh, mid-year school holidays, take a week off. Um, or, or two, uh, then go hard until spring, take a week off and then go hard until, you know, about mid December, where I'd always take sort of two, three, or even four weeks off. Um, you know, that kept me fresh because, you know, I'm sort of doing these four 11 week sprints. Um, at the beginning of those sprints, I'm energetic. I'm excited. I've just come back from a trip. Uh, I've got all of these listings um, that I've already listed prior to going on the trip, right? I'm not coming back and starting from zero prior to going on, on that holiday or trip. I've been, you know, listing as much as I can. I might've come back with, you know, five to 10 listings. I'm launching those. My team has been getting them ready, doing the photo shoots, getting the deck oiled, all of these kinds of things. Um, they're going online the day I get back. That Saturday, we've got you know a full um, day of opens. Um, we're selling those. We're listing more. We're going hard. You know, as the weeks roll on, my energy levels might be starting to decline, but I can see there's this light at the end of the tunnel because I know in you know four weeks, three weeks, two weeks, I've got another break coming up and I'm excited about that. Excellent. Okay. I'm looking forward to my real estate career. I think we're on a really good track. I will um, try and work with, I'll get myself a job as an associate and begin. Uh, Dan, before I let you go, and this has been a really informative chat that I think is relevant to any agent at any stage in their career. And I've really appreciated you walking me through it with good humor and grace. So I will ask you the final question that we ask all our podcast guests. If there was one key takeaway or last piece of advice that you'd like to leave our listeners with today, what would that be? Go hard. Go hard. Life is short. You know, life is short. And and I've had, you know, I've experienced tragedy as I'm sure a lot of people have. You know, we we think we have a lot longer on this earth than than you know sometimes we do. Uh, life is short. And I would just say go hard in everything too, you know, um, whether that's in your relationship, whether that's in business, whether that's financially and investing, you know, take risks go hard, um, you will uh, thrive, honestly. And if you don't take those risks, you know, you may look back with regrets. I'd rather get to the end and look back not regretting things. I certainly won't regret the things I've done. I'd probably more so regret the things that I haven't done. So I would just uh, urge everyone to, to, to go hard and, uh, and have fun along the way. Dan, that's great advice. Thank you so much for joining us on the Elevate podcast today. It's been brilliant speaking with you. You're going to be a successful agent. I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, thrive through the ranks. Uh, so let's stay in touch. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan. Take care. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Elevate podcast. With thanks to connectnow.com.au. Don't forget to get access to all of Elite Agent's premium resources, including a detailed episode guide for this podcast. Visit joineliteagent.com. 